We have covered spatial enhancement of images. Now we're going to talk about spectral enhancement of images. And just as I started spatial enhancement by just looking at the most basic thing you can do, zooming in, um, spectral enhancement, we're going to talk about the uh, most basic thing you can do, band selection. So um, different types of uh, features tend to get highlighted in different parts of the spectrum. Near infrared portion of the spectrum tends to be very good for vegetation. Uh, mid infrared tends to be very good for um, water and geology. Alternatively, some bands are impacted by atmospheric effects, particularly blue and green. And blue in particular um, is very often ignored uh, because for two reasons. Number one, the information in blue is kind of redundant with the information in green and red. Things tend to be bright or dark in the visible. I know that's not our experience. We um, see a wide range of colors, but statistically, things tend to be bright or not bright. Partially, that's just because of illumination effects Areas that are illuminated well are uh, areas with high re reflectance or high radiance in uh, blue and green and red and the other bands. Um, so blue very often can be ignored. Blue, of course, uh, is also the band most contaminated by Rayleigh scattering. So that's another good reason why you might want to get rid of blue. Um, Bands from red through the mid-infrared are mostly unaffected by the atmosphere and they capture most of the important uh, information in image. So um, since you don't really need blue and, and green, then you can concentrate on red and near-infrared and mid-infrared. Sometimes you might want to look at contrast between the two mid-infrared bands. Um, and of course, um, that's just for Landsat, for other systems, you know, for instance, you might want to look at, um, well, for instance, in, in World War, in, in a number of sensors now, you have a coastal blue um, and a regular blue. And the coastal blue, blue contrast, um, number one, um, it takes out the atmospheric effects. We'll see this because they're in both bands. And um, it also allows you to discriminate uh, water depth because you either have this very blue blue um, or a slightly blue of a slightly higher wave length. Um, so selection of bands is another important way um, you can uh, enhance images to uh, further your, your ability to, uh, in this case, visualize what's going on in an image, but also band selection for further processes like classification is also very important. So next simplest thing you can do is just image ratios. Okay, so taking one image and dividing it by another. So, you know, we could say we could have an equation that's like such and such index is band one over band two. So that means you've divided every pixel, uh, every pixel's value for, for band one to buy every, the same pixel's values for band uh, two. And you, the result is you get an image um, and that image um, is the, the result of the equation. So done very commonly, it serves to highlight subtle variations in the spectral responses of surface covers. And what I mean by that is that, you know, like I just said, you know, you tend to have these illumination differences in images. Maybe you've got, again, north and south uh, facing slopes. And um, you're gonna have different values for those. But if you ratio two bands, the the differences in illumination drop out and we'll see how that works so rather than looking at the absolute values you're actually looking with an image ratio at the slope between two um 
between two values. And the places where we tend to use these are places where you have rapidly changing um, reflectance values in your, your spectra. So at the red edge, the transition between red and near infrared, and then in the mid infrared where you have your water absorption features versus the rest of the mid infrared. And so you're gonna be able to pick up um, variations in the slope of those transitions that you might not otherwise see because they'd be masked by just the overall brightness variations in each of the bands. So here's the effect of uh, scene illumination um, and reducing it through spectral ratioing. So what we have here is two aspects, south and north, and two cover types, deciduous and uh, or broadleaf and needle leaf or coniferous forest. Okay, and of course, broadleaf will tend to have um, higher reflectance than needle leaf. Okay, so let's go down. Let's look at deciduous forests uh, on the sunlit um, side. Um, are going to have high digital numbers in both band A and band B. So 48, 50, high values. In shadow, it's going to be much lower, 18 and 19. But remember, the, the forests themselves are very similar, if not the same, um, at least conceptually. Um, so you're just getting these variations in the values based on the illumination. On the coniferous or needle leaf forests, you know, that same um, contrast between sunlit and shadow appears to be um, uh, the, the big contrast, right? 31 versus 11 for band A, 45 for versus uh, 16 for shadow. Um, and then if we look at sunlit uh, coniferous versus sunlit deciduous, those values have are more alike than in either case looking at sunlit from shadow. However, when we take the ratio, we find that you have much greater values for band A relative to band B than you do for the coniferous or needle leaf uh, systems. And this is actually sort of a the idea of, of band A and band B is near infrared versus red. And we know that near infrared is going to be higher uh, as, uh, than um, uh, for deciduous broadleaf stands versus needle leaf coniferous stands. And so now we have a way to discriminate the two reliably without, um, without having to fuss with doing a more general um, um, slope correction the way we talked about in radiometric correction, where you're trying to, you know, actually use a DEM to figure out illumination. You can do that, but um, this is really a much more straightforward uh, and, and direct way to do it without having to go through all that rigmarole. So ratios are used all over the place. I'm gonna talk about the big example is vegetation ratios. Again, there's this contrast between near IR and red. And so that can be used, um, there's a, a simple or ratio vegetation index, so referred to as SVI or RVI, and that's just near infrared over red. Um, the more popular vegetation index is NDVI, the Normalized Difference Vegetation Index. And so what that does is it takes the difference between NIR and red, and divides by the sum of NIR and red. And what that allows you to do is just better normalize for the, the brightness of the, the, the pixels themselves, okay? SVI does a pretty good job, NDVI takes it one step further. So if we look at uh, our local area, <clears throat> excuse me, you can see horse tooth there. Um, we're looking in band four of TM near IR and band three red of TM. And you can see the 
the signature of topography to the west of town, right? As you get up into the mountains. And so everywhere you look, you can see uh, a pattern of streams and then um, shadowed areas to on north facing slopes and, and bright areas on south facing slopes. And um, you see this in both bands. Well, here we have those ratios, simple ratio and DVI, and, and by using both bands in the same index, we are able to take out that topographic variation and just leave the vegetation information. Now you do see some topographic information um, or topographic signatures, I should say, or, or you appear to be able to, but um, what you're really seeing is the fact that um, vegetation on south facing slopes um, um, have, um, their environment is uh, hotter and drier than on uh, north facing slopes, okay? So you just tend to get more vegetation on north facing slopes than on south facing slopes. And so that signature, which is a real vegetation property, remains in the data, but the actual topographic signature is, is taken out. So now I wanna talk about principal components analysis. So we've talked about the R value between individual bands and the fact that if you have a high uh, magnitude, so either like near plus one or near negative one, that you have redundant information. The information in one band is similar to the information in the other band. And that's because of A, illumination effects, but then also just because there's a certain correlation in, in many land covers between the various um, brightnesses in different bands. So particularly soils. Soils, um, you know, their brightness in one band tends to be similar to the brightness in the next band. Uh, that's just the way they work. Um, PCA, principal components analysis, analyzes the covariance or correlation between bands and, and selects the information from the most different bands, okay? And what this does is maximizes the unique information provided in each band used. So for instance, you have multiple bands that come out of a principal component. These are not spectral bands. These are principal component bands. And um, principal component one explains the majority of the scene variance, okay? And so that's generally just the effect of illumination. Um, and then principal component two will explain the next most important source of variance and so on and so forth uh, as you go down through the, the bands. So the idea is you start with say seven bands from TM, you do the principal components analysis and you come up with principal component uh, image that explains most of the information. So on the left, the, the original image, that's 100% of the information. But with three pro principal components, you can get somewhere between like 90 and 95% of the variation explained. And you can do it in three bands. Now, why do you want to do it in three bands? Well, number one, uh, it saves space. That's not as important a reason anymore, uh, but it does save space. The other thing is if you have three bands, you can display them as red, green, and blue. And so you can see almost all the information in the image at one time. Whereas if you have seven bands, you will have to look at like bands one, two, three, and then one, two, four, and then one, two, five, and then you get it. Um, that's a lot of combinations to look at. And again, these new bands that we have are called components or principal components. So here we have scatter plots of um, the, uh, the bands from a single TM image. And this is gonna show you the pattern of correlations. So if we look at bands one through three, 
okay? So show you how to read these. Um, that first row at top, TM1 is the Y axis for each of those. You just kind of move that across. That's always the Y axis. So that's always gonna be what, what thematic mapper band one is being plotted on. Similarly, the first row, thematic mapper is the band one is being plotted as the X axis and so on and so forth. Um, so if we look at the upper three by three um, uh, cells from this, uh, this figure, what we see are the first three thematic mapper bands, all of them invisible, and how well correlated they are with each other. And the answer is very well correlated. This is what happens in the, in the visible. Um, if you know how bright something is in one band, then you have a pretty good idea of what it is in another visible band. If we go one one more set of rows and columns, we're going to look at TM4, that's near IR. Near IR is closely related to the visible bands, but um, there's some significant features there that have to do with vegetation. And then as we go out into TM5, 6, and 7, of course, five is mid infrared, six is thermal infrared, seven is again mid infrared, and you can see that um, they're not highly related to uh, those first four bands. Mid infrared is going and doing its own thing, thermal is doing its own thing. Um, the only high correlations you really see are between TM5 and TM7, and um, that's because they're they're you know relatively close uh spectrally because you actually only need to look at half of those graphs because they're redundant you have one graph in the original that's tm1 versus tm2 and another one that's uh tm2 versus tm1 so just to note whenever you have a diagram like this you really only have to interpret one half of it so Principal components analysis, you can, you can explain it by starting with a, a simple plot of two bands, okay? We're not gonna show the data points. You have to imagine the data points. Um, and, and just imagine this, this oval that I've drawn um, surrounds most of the, the points, okay? And then each of the, the bands there, okay? are gonna have some mean brightness value for uh, each band, okay? So we have, you have to imagine the scatter plot of X1 and X2, and then uh, each band having uh, a mean value. Okay, so the first step is we're going to move the, um, the origin of this graph into the, the sort of the center of mass of the, the uh, data values. So we're gonna subtract the, the mean of band one from band one, mean of band two from band two. And so now, you know, the means are gonna be zero, the new means, and all your points are going to be uh, clustered around those zeros. And again, filling in that oval shape. Now, The, I've drawn an arrow in there. And that arrow uh, is meant to be drawn through the, the longest portion of that oval, okay? So the longest portion of that oval is where you have the greatest variation in data values, okay? So, um, and that is, uh, associated with where you have the most variability, okay? So we have two variables here, two bands here. We, we plotted them out, we put that over there in there to re represent it, but um, both both variables are, are, you know, one is low where the other is low and one is high when the other is high. And so the, the maximum variation is explained 
by a line that, that cuts through the longest axis of that oval, okay? And then what we're gonna do, okay, as expressed by that red line is that's gonna become the new first principal component. So now we have a new set of axes, one that goes through the longest axis, and then one that is perpendicular to that axis. And then, then that's the second principal component. Then for every point we have, and I sort of put in a, a little imaginary point here, we calculate a new set of, of coordinates. One that tells us how far along principal components one we are from the, the origin with principal components two, and one that shows us how far along we are with, along principal component two relative to where the origin is with principal component one. Um, so that gives us a new set of coordinates, okay? Um, and because these two axes, um, principal component one and principal component two, are um, at right angles to each other, okay? The new values that you're gonna calculate are uncorrelated with each other, right? Um, if we just consider two bands, you can imagine now using principal component one and principal component two as your axes, um, if the, there were points scattered around within that oval, they would have a correlation in the new axes of zero. In the original, they had some correlation. In the new set of axes, they have um, uh, uh, zero correlation. Now, um, this is just two axes. And the problem uh, is that it's hard to, it's hard to draw in more than two axes and it's, it's kind of hard for us to imagine. But principal components can have an infinite number of, uh, of axes. Um, but as you get up into higher principal components, um, it's highly dependent upon the data set you're applying principal components to, but they tend to become less and less important, okay? So here's an example of different principal components at top. So the first principal component in the upper left-hand corner, um, again, that's for our local scene, and the primary source of variability there is just uh, brightness. So that's illumination effects, and then it's also um, spectral effects. So that, that big white blob uh, sort of to the, the left of the image, that's North Park, okay? North Park tends to have either um, open ground, um, open soil, or, um, you know, it, it's not green for very long up there. And so, you know, it tends to have drying vegetation. Those things are all bright. In the upper right-hand corner of the image, um, you know, within that first principal component one image, are rangelands to the east of Fort Collins. Again, those tend to show a lot of soil and soil tends to be very bright. Um, so you have topographic effects and then overall brightness effects in principal component one. Now, principal component two um, shows a contrast between, well, for the one, one point, uh, North Park, and which you can see is dark here, okay, versus areas along the front range there that are very bright. And so principal component two is a vegetation related component. Um, and so the, the more, the higher the value, the more the vegetation. So that tends to be um, in scenes that are, um, vegetated, that tends to be the second principal component. That is, you've got um, brightness on the first. With principal components, brightness is always on the first. Um, 
because that's what explains the most variance. And then in the second principal component, you have um, vegetation. The third principal component here has low values for snow and water. Um, and this is a principal component that is, responds to um, uh, the presence of uh, water, first of all. But if you look at it, you'll notice areas of coniferous forest tend to have um, sort of medium values. And that's because the, that third principal component um, tends to be sensitive to scattering effects in the mid-infrared in coniferous forests. Um, and so that's just one of those things that it's sensitive to. So you get, um, you get moisture effects and you get um, this coniferous vegetation effect. And then if you look in the bottom left, what I'm showing there is principal components three, two, and one as um, blue, green, and red. And so what you see is North Park, okay, looks apparently red. That's because it's mostly bright. There isn't a lot of green or moisture in there at this time. Um, forests uh, are blue or cyan. And that's because they're they have greenness, right? They are they are green uh, vegetation, um, and because they tend to have this mid infrared effect, so you know the coniferous vegetation tends to have that um, more of a a cyan cast to it. Okay, um, and then we have vegetation along the front range, and that tends to be yellow. And the reason that tends to be yellow is that uh, with agricultural areas, you're seeing a lot of soil background, which is bright, and you're seeing, um, sorry, and you're also seeing uh, vegetation. So uh, brightness is being displayed as red, uh, greenness, vegetation cover is being displayed as green. When you have red and green being displayed, it's going to look yellow. And then I've just, um, Put some other combinations, 432, 654. Uh, and what you can see is that as you go to these higher order principal components, um, the amount of contrast uh, that you see um, goes down. And that's because you're explaining less and less variance with each subsequent principal component. So reviewing that. PCA transformation is basically a rotation of the original axes to new orientations that are perpendicular or orthogonal to each other, and therefore have, have in, in theory, zero correlation between the new principal components. The first principal component explains the maximum amount of variation in the seven-dimensional space defined by a seven uh, thematic mapper bands. And the first three principal components commonly contain over 90% of the image information. And then any noise in the imagery is commonly relegated to higher principal components. That's sort of uncorrelated noise, uh, noise that just isn't correlated with other bands. And therefore, it kind of gets shoved up into the higher principal components, which is good because then you get a, a clearer image in the first few uh, principal components. So this gives you a sense of, um, of that effect. Um, so on the left, six boxes are TM bands, um, one, two, three, four, five, and seven, so emitting the, the thermal band. And on the right, principal components, one, two, three, four, five, six. And what you can see in the TM is that the same pattern of brightness and darkness is shown in every band, right? The bands are highly correlated. This is a desert scene. So, you know, there's not a lot of difference um, in the, the, the brightness in adjacent bands. If you look at the principal component, on the other hand, that first principal component looks like the pattern that you see in all of the TM bands. 
However, if you go to the second principal component, that um, pattern is mostly gone. There's some residual spatial pattern that has to do with um, some kind of variation that is associated with the features you see, but isn't purely brightness. And principal component three, you can still see something of a pattern, but by the time you get out to four, five, and six, uh, you're not seeing that pattern. You're seeing basically, you know, atmospheric noise, very subtle spectral effects that you may not be interested in. And again, that means you can take those first three principal components and look at them all at the same time and get all the information in that image um, without having to look at various band combinations. Um, principal components, again, if you have images with vegetation in it, it tends to um, extract the contrast between bands three and four, red and near infrared, due to the vegetation near uh, red edge. So when there's vegetation, suddenly you don't have the same relationship between band three and band four as you do in areas which have, you know, soil or similar features that are sort of highly correlated in their uh, reflectances throughout the, the, uh, the multiple bands you might have in a multispectral image. So uh, again, on the left, the TM images, they all have a certain pattern that you can kind of see in each one. When you do the principal components, that first principal component is brightness, and that second principal component is vegetation. It's very common that that's how it's going to work out. Uh, in this case, um, we're just showing bands two, three, and four. This is for a um, agricultural landscape, but a desert agricultural landscape. And in this case, at the bottom, principal component one, again, overall brightness, and then principal component two there is showing you um, the areas of, uh, of vegetation. Um, now, in this case, areas of vegetation are being shown as darker than other areas. And this is something that can happen with principal components, um, depending on um, um, noise characteristics and the, the relationship of values in all the bands that are being analyzed, you can have principal components that either, you know, give you the, uh, are positively correlated with vegetation or negatively correlated with vegetation or, or any other feature, right? I mean, the first one is always positively correlated with the, the sort of overall mean value of a of each pixel. But beyond that, you can get this flipping effect where you might be interested in areas that are moist, but actually your index is uh, an index of aridity. High values are associated with aridity. You just have to learn to interpret it inversely. And then especially in this image, you can see once we get out the principal components three, you're seeing very subtle like differences in um, uh, sensor noise. You see there's some streaks there. I don't know what that is. I don't know if this is MSS. It's not directly observable um, in the context of the, the good spectral data that's in either the original bands or the first two principal components, but it can get picked up by the principal components analysis, again, in these higher bands. And in this case, it only takes three bands to, to you know, for that third band to be associated just with noise. So why use principal components analysis? Well, it, it decorrelates spectral data, okay? We've said multispectral bands are often highly correlated because of the, the material spectral correlation, i.e. your material might have similar reflectances in multiple bands topography and its effect on illumination, and then sensor band, the, the space between them. So um, if you have two bands that are very close to each other, likely they're going to give you very similar spectral information. Um, decorrelation separates the individual 
components or sources of variability into separate bands so you can um, you know, observe them directly. And then it compresses the variance. So the, the variance, um, instead of being uh, uh, having seven bands, might be able to, you might be able to reduce your analysis assist to three bands. Now, maybe that doesn't seem like a big deal, you know, for a, a single Landsat image, but I did an analysis, for instance, in which we used a year's worth of global modus data. So modus data at like 500 meter spatial resolution for the entire globe. And we used all the data for one year. And so what I did was um, I used a two-step principal components analysis where I reduced all of the spectral data for each date into just three bands. And then I reduced all the temporal, you know, the differences between date variability into, I think it was like another eight bands. So we went from having something like 300 original bands down to eight bands. And that makes a big difference when you're processing very large data sets like a, a global data set. So why not use the PCA? It's it's data dependent. So the, the coefficients that allow you to do the rotation, they change from scene to scene because it's sensitive to what the actual data values are. And so that makes consistent interpretation of PC uh, um, or principal component images difficult. Um, spectra of the tails, particularly in small areas, may be lost if you ignore your higher order principal components. So small areas, um, variation in, in spectral values um, might be important for some analyses, say for trying to find wetlands in a scene where there aren't many wetlands, but um, they're not going to affect the overall variance very much. So they're probably going to be ignored in the first three um, bands. Uh, so if you throw out the higher ones, you're not going to catch those differences. Uh, it's, it's computationally expensive. That is, it takes a long time to process large images or many spectral bands. Um, again, for a thematic mapper image, it's, it's not that bad. Uh, and, and you have to calculate the correlation between each band. And that's what really uh, takes the most time. You know, the, the covariance matrix is just an a name for something that's similar to um, a matrix of the correlation values between each of the bands in the image. So another transformation you can use is the tasseled cap transformation. It's similar to the principal components analysis, but it uses the same set of coefficients for each image of a given type. So for thematic mapper data, there is a, a single set of coefficients that are used for the transformation that um, apply to all, at least all the thematic mapper data from a particular um, uh, sensor. So the one from Landsat 5, uh, that'll have one that'll be slightly different from Landsat 7 or, or Landsat 8, but um, very similar coefficients um, between them. Um, so it's going to transform Landsat data into a reduced set of bands, okay? Um, and so you get out three bands that um, always represent the same, uh, the same pattern of spectral um, reflectances. And those bands are brightness, greenness and wetness, okay? Why is the, why was the tassel cap created and why has it been seen as useful? Well, um, what they found back in like the early 80s was that if you plotted out brightness versus greenness, okay, the first two, 
uh, tassel captain disease. And if you followed a single agricultural pixel, you could watch it, um, and you can see the arrows there on the left, you can watch it become um, darker and then greener over the course of a season up to up to the point where it's at peak greenness okay so it's getting brighter and it's getting um and greener i'm sorry it's getting darker and greener as you go up and then after you reach um its maximum green point and it it uh, produces seed then it tends to decrease uh and get uh, um, it tends to get a little brighter and less green. So you could actually monitor, you know, individual pixels as to what their behavior was during the course of a agricultural season. And then moving to the right, um, it was found that standard land cover types fit in a particular way within this same space. It was actually outside of that dotted line. That's where all the agricultural fields are. But like clear water is dark, it has low brightness and not green, okay? Turbid water is a little brighter, uh, but not very green. A little brighter because it's probably got some soil in it. Concrete, urban surfaces, those have the highest brightness, but again, are not going to be green. And then natural vegetation tends to occupy this spot um, above the, the outline there. And that tends to be, um, you know, uh, gr uh, relatively dark, but um, with high greenness. And so these are, repeatable from image to image because the tassel cap indices can be applied from image to image. And then uh, tassel cap is specifically designed for um, each um, to be used with Landsat imagery. Okay. And it's a, it changes a little bit from sensor to sensor. Um, but the same coefficients are to be applied the same way each and every time, which is fundamentally different from PCA in which each scene is going to have a, a unique set of components based on what their data values are. So here's an example of um, um, the first three um, tassel capped indices. So um, brightness at upper left, again, looking very much like the uh, first principal component, because that's also related to the total brightness. Uh, greenness, again, having that same pattern, you know, North uh, North Park being very dark and the irrigated agriculture on the uh, front range being bright. Um, and then finally you have, uh, or, or next you have wetness. Okay, and so areas like North Park are not very wet. Um, there are some, um, uh, lakes in there and reservoirs that are very dark and then you have this um, this effect associated with coniferous forest where you have relatively high wetness values and there are actually three more principal components I'm sorry three more tassel cap components um, haze um, fifth and sixth and basically nobody uses them because they're not terribly useful um, uh, but like a principal components analysis, haze is sort of taken out of the entire analysis. That's kind of just where there was atmospheric um, uh, conditions influencing the image. And that's been taken out and given its, its own image. And unless you're interested in the atmospheric uh, conditions, um, you, you can ignore it in fifth and sixth basically just re repeat some of the patterns that you already see in brightness, greenness, and wetness. Again, you have three bands, so you can assign the three bands to red, green, and blue. And the standard assignment for coefficients, uh, I'm sorry, for bands in a tassel capped image is that 
red is assigned to brightness, green to greenness, and blue to wetness. And so here you can see, um, it's kind of zoomed in on town here. You can see horse tooth in the middle. On the upper right hand um, uh, portion of the image, you see uh, rangeland and steppe. Um, so those are red mostly because they're very, they're very bright. You're seeing a lot of soil from this image. Um, areas of, of agriculture uh, tend to be yellow. And again, that's because they're bright and green. So, um, uh, so those are displayed as red and green. And red and green together being displayed gives you yellow. Um, blue is wetness. And you can see it does a really good job of pulling out the various um, uh, lakes uh, and, and some of the rivers in town. Um, and you can also see in the left, there's a little patch there. Um, that I believe is snow and it is bright. So it, it's got red and it's uh, wet. So it's got blue. Put those together, what are you seeing? Magenta. Um, and then you could also see the majority of the forest there is that cyan color. And that means that it's green. And it has this wetness signature that's due to the mid infrared um, scattering. So um, you can't see it in this image because we don't have a lot of deciduous forest, but in um, landscapes where you have both deciduous and coniferous or broadleaf and needle leaf vegetation that you can make the distinction very easily. So pros and cons of tassel cap, why use it? It's a fixed reference. You can, you can take an image, make the calculations and, um, and interpret any tassel capped image the same way. You know what you're looking at. Um, so you get this consistent interpretation. And the, the, and the variations you're seeing are related directly to geophysical properties in the scene. Brightness, greenness, wetness, these are things we're fundamentally interested in. Why not use the tassel cap? Well, it's, it's sort of a non-optimal compression of the data. Principal components analysis is always going to provide you in the first band with the most correlated variability, and the next band will give you the second greatest source of uncorrelated variability, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. Tassel cap, um, particularly if you have landscapes that that don't have a lot of vegetation, um, it it may it may ignore effects that you're interested in. So you got to be careful when you do that um, when you're when you're working with landscapes that aren't assuming that the things you're going to be interested in in these scenes are brightness, which you're kind of always interested in. And if you know if it's Death Valley vegetation, well, you may or may not be interested in that. You might be interested in geology. So in that case, tassel cap doesn't have much to tell you. Um, another reason is you have to you have to work with sensors that where the um, people have der derived the tassel cap indices, and that requires multi temporal data for each sensor. It's kind of complicated, but you know people have done it for most most sensors at this point. 